Welcome, everybody. My name is Michael with Leading Edge Seminars, and I'm very, very happy to be here with Eliana Gill. And we're going to talk a little bit about her program and other things. And I'll just say a few orienting things. Uh, first, uh, if you feel comfortable leaving your screen on, it's always great to see faces. And uh, we really encourage any questions you would like to ask Eliana about her approaches, her work, whatever, or about our program in Cancun. Uh, you're certainly welcome, and you can do that in one of two ways. You can go to the chat box and just put your question in. And Emily, who you may see on the screen, who is officially our hostess with the mostess, uh, will be keeping an eye on the chat line if you have any questions to put in there. Or you can say, I'd like to ask a question, and Emily will call you to the screen. Or if your screen is on, you can do an old-fashioned wave um, or use your Zoom thing for waving, whatever you <laughs> Whatever works for you, we want to make sure your questions are answered. Uh, also, this is this will be live transcription. So if you like seeing the words as well as hearing them, you can put on the live transcription box in the bottom of your Zoom screen. And finally, um, we know a number of you watching this may be watching on a video, not live. Uh, so everyone who signed up for this program will get a copy of the video of this half hour, as well as a special bonus discount coupon if you decide to join us in Cancun. So that's kind of the introductory remarks. So Eliana, welcome. Welcome to you and uh, so Thank glad you. you could join us. Thank you. You know, I thought a good place to start, you know, you, you know you're so well known uh, in the field. Um, and you've seen a lot of changes in the field. Now you're running your own institute in Virginia. But just take us down a little bit to start off memory lane and where you saw the field in terms of working with children and families when you started and, and how it evolved to where we are now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Read your digest version. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, memory lane. So I think that I can say anyway, my whole life experience career has been a while working with traumatized children. And when this all started to gain attention in the early 70s, that's when I came on the scene and we didn't know exactly what we were doing. All we knew was we were using our best instincts to try to help. But initially in those days, the kids were placed in foster care and then the parents were basically given some services and then they united, reunited the families. And with the expectation that then everything would be fine because they'd had a brief separation of some type. And the kids really didn't get a lot of attention other than being in foster care. So things have really evolved where everyone's pretty clear that children need an opportunity to have some attention to see what their needs are. And also that we have to bridge the gap with the parents, that we really have to do some dyadic work that is in vivo, that is experiential, and that the parents and the kids need equal attention in terms of therapy. So that's one of the big changes that I think has happened. The other thing that I'm really aware of is I started out as a family therapist. And in all of the courses that I took, there was very little mention of young children. The family therapist sometimes would come do demonstrations and it was with adolescents. So they, they like it when the kids could talk and respond to their questions. And they were creative questions. It was really fun to watch. But I also felt that whenever young children came, they gave them papers and crayons and told them to go draw. And so they were completely excluded in the field of family therapy. Likewise, play therapy, I think, was born out of the child guidance movement. And there, there was a lot of attention to the children paid a lot of developmental assessments and work with the kids, but the parents were a little bit excluded. So we've really moved into a culture that's very attachment focused and that really believes at this juncture, which I think is different, that we really have to treat the family system and definitely attachment work is going to be part of that. And we have to work with people in dyads. So this has stretched everybody out of their comfort zone a little bit to learning more about family dynamics. Um, and I guess the last thing I really would like to emphasize is that most of my training was in talk therapy. And so the expectation is you sit in your chair, they sit in theirs and you ask questions and they talk. And 
I think we've really moved so far away from that concept now with the idea that the neuroscience kind of informs us that we've got to get people up and moving and active and that the brain is going to be more receptive if there's been movement and oxygenation. And so I started um, really integrating as much as I could novelty, surprise, uh, most of my clients were court mandated. So they would come in like this, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm here, but I don't believe I did anything wrong. And, and so making an invitation so that they're opening themselves up and not feeling judged, I think required me to get really pretty actively involved in the expressive therapy so that there were alternate languages. And so I get really excited about that possibility just to introduce people to so many different ways of communicating with others and engaging them and connecting with them that involve, you know, art and play and sand therapy and movement and drama. And to do that, I think we have to get a little bit out of our comfort zone and familiarity with simply talking and just adding more languages. I always say I'm trilingual. I speak English, I speak Spanish, and I speak symbol language or metaphor language. And I'm always very, very excited to share that with other people. So that was long-winded, but... <laughs> oh, no, that's great. You know, you know um, I'd like your impression about this because it seems to me there's so much more acceptance of therapy that's not just talk. Uh, that's that, that's really come about in the last 10, 15 years. Of course, Bessel van der Kolk's work basically saying talk therapy just doesn't work alone for so many people who've been deeply hurt, who've had trauma in their life. Um, and where before, it seems to me, expressive therapies might have been seen oh, that's nice, it's an adjunct and maybe you can do some nice things with kids and yeah, it's kind of a good idea. But now it's kind of saying, it's an essential idea that if you if you rely just on talking with children or families or even people who've been traumatized and now they're adults, your chances of success are much less likely. So what do you think of that? I agree wholeheartedly and I, I will be eternally grateful to Bessel van der Kolk because I think he was one of the first people to come out and talk about, for example, trauma-focused yoga and to talk about massage and to talk about music therapy. I mean, he's always on the cutting edge and I think he also is married to someone who has brought that into his life personally. So it's been wonderful to see that kind of evolution in his thinking and I agree 100%. Trauma tends to be embedded in the right hemisphere of the brain. Uh, trauma is a full body experience. Um, you can't just cognitively discuss trauma and assume that everything's gonna fall into place. And now we have all these wonderful body therapies and just so many attempts at integrating. And it's not that anyone's saying verbal therapy has to be eliminated. I don't think that'll ever happen. It just has its time and it has its place. And then Bruce Perry talks a little bit about neurosequential. And he believes that all these therapies have something to offer. They're wonderful. At the same time, it's when you deliver them. You have to make sure that people are available for cognitive work. Sometimes they're not. They're in the bottom parts of their brain and they're dysregulated and they can't attend to anything. So the importance of just Whatever you're doing, you're addressing where that person is at this moment in time and just making sure the invitation is well received and you can really engage with people and make connections. We were taught in school sometimes to stay sort of, I don't know, distant, to be kind of like this empty canvas and not express. And I think that's moved a little bit too, where we're now recognizing that we actually have the ability to resonate just with other people's neurons and biology that our nervous system affects your nervous system. And I just think all of that is really good information. And it in some ways gives permission for some of these alternative ways of connecting with people and helping. So it's an exciting time for sure. It is. And in looking, you've provided really a lot of information about what you're gonna be doing in Cancun. Each of the five days, you know, we're having sessions in the morning only. And you have very detailed um, description of what you'll be doing. And I'm wondering in terms of these expressive therapies, if you look at what you're presenting, where you started from, the kind of therapies that you started doing, and I'm sure have evolved, 
and the newer ones, which maybe just came into focus in the last five or 10 years in terms of what you'll be presenting. Well, you know, um, I'm going to be covering a lot of the expressive therapies. So that's play and sand and art and drama and movement. And we're going to have a lot of fun. But to me, this training gives me the opportunity to do experiential learning. And so at least to give people an opportunity for experiential learning. So every day they'll be doing something. They'll get their hands into something. Um, they'll be moving in particular ways so that they can develop a sense of being intentional with the things they do. A lot of people have toys in their room and it's unintentional kind of let's see what the kid does or here's a way that we can, you know, kind of what's that called? Um, build a bridge for the child. Mm -hmm. But this is using these techniques to advance a treatment goal. This is applying them in such a way that makes sense with your theoretical orientation. So each day I'm hoping for experiential learning, um, stretching that comfort zone a little bit, but then going into applicability and integration. So I'm going to teach you something. How do you make that your own? How does that get tweaked so that you can apply it and feel like it's theoretically congruent with what you do? So it's making it your own. So I'm excited about that piece of it as well. Can you give an example of one of the day's experiential activities that you're looking forward to leading? Sure. Um, for example, and I'll just throw something out using symbols. And I might say to people, think about a relationship that has some difficulty for you. Now go find a symbol of that relationship and the difficulty embedded in that relationship. And we people might go out into nature and just go find something. And I'll probably have some little things for people to pick from. And then you put it kind of in front of you in a little, like a, a circle. And then what I'll start saying to people is, okay, so now you've identified that relationship issue that you have, think about the smallest first step you can take to begin to address that. Just think of the smallest first step. And this is a technique called solution circles, which we'll do. And people will go and find something that represents a very small first step and a second step and a third step, and maybe successes they've had in the past with similar issues. So that's a kind of an experience that people will have. And you know, people will invest differently. Um, some people will take it as an opportunity to do some real work, some therapy work, if you want to call it that, but something that will be important to them and yield some positive results. And other people will do it thinking of clients. And I'm going to pretend to be a client doing this thing that's difficult. So it's that symbol language, that metaphor work, and then addressing metaphors and working with them. All that is kind of the kind of stuff that I want to spend some time with. And and as you said, you'll be going on to dis discussion of the clinical work involved. And I'm sure you'll be bring case examples. Is this Absolutely. the kind of session that you'll invite people to bring case examples? Absolutely. And I will be bringing some for people to look at and ponder and, and reflect with me about what they're seeing and how to begin to think and organize your own thinking about what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at a piece of art, what, what are the variables involved in looking at a piece of art? How does it inform you? And then if you're wanting to advance a treatment goal, what art activity might work with that? Or what art approach might you think about? So it's going to be really interactive. And my hope is that people will take risk and try things out and experiment and explore. And that's what we ask our clients to do. You know, so I'm hopeful <laughs> that everybody will be in that frame of mind of just kind of seeing where things lead you and how they move you and touch you and how you can connect with other people as a result. Hopefully they'll work at small tables or in dyads or something like that. So it'll be relational for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you've done these kind of programs before in residential settings, correct? Yes, I actually did them in Cape Cod for a number oh, of yeah. years and we worked there from nine until I think 1230. And then people would go off and come back and report the next day about the whale watching. It's mm -hmm. so nurturing. And then the environment in general is so nurturing. There's nothing I think more therapeutic than being near the ocean and being able to go out and just, just absorb that kind of nurturing uh, from the environment. So I'm lo really looking forward to that as well. Yeah. Um... And we'll 
open for questions for Eliana, anything about her approaches or anything at all. Uh, I'll, and you can put those in the chat box or raise your hand. Uh, I'll say a few things about the experience in, in Cancun, which in some ways was inspired by the Cape Cod programs, which seemed like such a great idea. You play in the, you work in the morning, you have a lot of effort, a lot of times to play. And living in Canada for all these years, uh, getting away in the wintertime has always been important to me because it just seems so essential to feel the sun and have the light and not have seven layers of clothing on, on me. Um, so the idea of doing it in the winter made sense. And uh, we did this last year at this resort. And um, I must say, it's a beautiful all-inclusive resort that has fantastic facilities, really good food, lots of restaurants, really attentive to the needs of, uh, of, of everyone who's coming there. And it's on a beach, of course, and it's not in Cancun proper, which is kind of a busy place. It's south of Cancun a little bit. So it's really a very nice location. And in terms of experiences, uh, <clears throat> we also uh, have a number of excursions planned and people had so much fun. I think partially it had to do with coming out of COVID because it was the first time that people were really together in a room with other people learning and even going on vacation and getting out of the four walls of their house yeah. and looking at screens. Um, so <clears throat> our hope is that's what's gonna happen this year. Um, and we have all the information on our website. We'll send that out at the end of, of this along with that discount coupon. But uh, last year, just to be in a beautiful place and with great people, because the other thing I noticed, and one of the reasons we wanted to do something like this is because you ever been to a conference where it's a great conference, but then you go out to lunch with somebody you never met before, you have a great conversation. Now, if I asked you two years later, what do you remember at the conference? You'll say, oh, that lunch. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so the, 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 there's lots, and what people did last year, lots of opportunity for lunches and time and as well as yoga in the morning. Uh, we'll have a person doing yoga every morning for those who want to do that. So um, that's a few things about the program. Yeah. Um, so we can open for questions at this time if there is anyone who has any questions at all. Um, I'm not seeing any in the chat so far, but from some of our previous Q and A's, um, we have had the question about um, what level of training will this be? Is this designed for beginner play therapists, for intermediate, advanced? Um, what does the program look like from that perspective? You know, my my idea is basically that this will be introductory for people who don't necessarily use any of the expressive therapies. We're talking about a continuum of expressive therapists. So my idea is the play therapist, for example, might really enjoy being exposed to more art therapy and vice versa. Um, I also would like for people who do have a lot of training and background in play therapy or let's say art therapy or whatever, to have that opportunity to think more clinically about how to deepen the work. So no one's going to leave being a certified play therapist or art therapist or anything like that, but it'll be an, uh, I think people will have an understanding of the basic principles of expressive therapies, when they can be applied, what the value of applying them is, and just really thinking more critically and intentionally about how to apply these methods to advance the therapy goals that you have for your clients. So I, I just really wanna make it accessible. The other thing is I get the feedback all the time is I don't have all that stuff in my room and I don't want all that stuff in my room. So everything that I teach at the uh, Cancun uh, conference is going to be something that can be shown in three or four or five different ways that don't involve purchasing a lot of materials. So for example, when I was saying um, you can go find symbols out in the world, nature is a perfect environment to go out and find symbols. You would be surprised what people can do with that or with rocks or with uh, cut out papers or with pictures from magazines. So I will be really emphasizing that you don't have to spend a ton of money and get your rooms full of play materials in order to 
implement some of the basic principles of play or art or sand or whatever else it might be. And, you know, I always think that we are our biggest resource and just the ability to connect with people physically and to do fun games and be active and, again, get their bodies going, get their um, brains a little bit more receptive. Um, I think all of those things will be very helpful to anyone who is already doing therapy and is seasoned or anyone who is brand new. So I'm thinking of it as somewhere in the middle. Um, and that's my hope. Great. So we'll see. We had a question come in. Um, yes. Will your training provide modification of play therapy strategies for clients who are nonverbal or with um, comorbidities such as ASD or ADHD? Yes, I believe so. Because again, what I'm going to do is kind of review the basic principles and then have people think through how would this then be applied to different populations or different problems or different issues that are coming up. So the idea is to think critically. It's and, and you know, there's tons of different kinds of play therapy. People use that term as if there's one. There isn't. There's child-centered, there's directive, there's dyadic, there's all these wonderful models that sometimes people don't really even hear about unless they're in already in the play therapy field. So, and the same applies to art therapy and drama therapy and sand therapy. There's just lots of different ways this can be applied. And as long as you're thinking critically and clinically about how to advance the goals with your client. So it's going to be a real clinical lens on how to um, take these ideas and implement them in a way that makes sense to the clinicians that are participating. That's the goal. Um, does the training incorporate expressive therapy with families? Absolutely. Now, that's one of my... Uh, that's one of my passions is working with families, because I think sometimes people forget all these little kids come with a group of people with them or at one or more. And sometimes we leave them out too much. So just as the family therapist left out the kids, sometimes the kids therapists feel a little more awkward with families. And so when I consult, that's like one of the biggest consultation questions. How do I make an invitation to the family? Um, and they say things like, well, what if they come in and they go, that's weird. I can't do that. That's for kids. And I go, yeah, a lot of people say that. And here's how you would respond to that. And here's how you would invite them. And so we'll be role playing a lot of these things because I love of that experience of hearing, well, what's your worst fear of what a parent might do? Well, that they might say that I'm not paying for you to play with my child. And how do you respond to that? And so we'll talk about all those things. So I, I'd like to follow up with that, Ellie, and I'd like to follow up because I, I, I began my social work career when structural family therapy was very popular. And even the idea of working with families was rebellious as opposed to working with individuals. But I can't imagine working with families in play and play. So can you give an example, a case example of I'll, and what I'll it give, looks like? Yeah, I'll give you a really quick example of something. Okay. Remember the clients that come in like this oh, and yeah. so they are expecting that I'm going to judge them and I'm going to be I don't know what they're expecting. So what I say is, you know what, everybody just get up and I've got a family in front of me with kids and parents and and they're all not in a good place. And so I'll say, here is a balloon. And all I want you to do for the moment is keep the balloon up in the air. And so then the family starts, they're like, what? And then, but there's the balloon and they start doing it. And the kids get into it usually faster. And then I'll put a second balloon in, a third balloon in, a fourth balloon in. By about the fourth balloon, this is like getting really difficult and challenging and stressful. Then I take the fourth one away and then the third one and then the second one. And then we sit down. So I just asked them, what was that like for you? And they all talk about how hard it was to have four balls in the air. And then when that metaphor is something I use for when they present me with all the problems in their life. And I say, this is like the balloons. There's too many up in the air. So our first task is going to be to pick the problem you want to really focus on. And as a matter of fact, you can pick a balloon. We'll put a name on it. And so it's just playfulness. It's just something unexpected. And one of the things we know about the brain and plasticity is that novelty tends to really make the brain more available, more there's more plasticity. And so I just like to surprise people. 
And, and a lot of times people will sit down and go, well, that was that was kind of fun. And, you know, and you hear like hints of laughter. And I love that when people start laughing with each other, you know that you're bridging a gap and they're going to connect that way. They're going to remember. Remember that lady we went to see and did the balloons with us? That was really fun. They'll remember that a lot more than something else. That's just well, a little. Know, <laughs> it sounds, you know, when people, when families come to, to, to therapy, I mean, the parents expect to be blamed and the child expects to be blamed. And yeah. it's going to be like worse than going to the dentist. Yes. Because and someone's going to yeah. be proven wrong. And the therapist is going to see you're incompetent, bad, have all kinds oh. of labels. And so that, this seems to be a way to lighten, which opens up the channels for change, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. And that whole litany of here's all my problems. And there's like 18 yeah, of them. Talk about that. Yeah. It's just really hard. So anyway, this is just a different way. So. Uh, and what is drama therapy? Well, drama therapy is really a, a technique, I guess you would say, to get people in touch with their feelings, with their thoughts, to begin to pretend play, to role play. Um, it's really action oriented. So people aren't really talking about a problem, they're actually doing. So show me what that looks like in your body. Um, and if a kid says, you know, I'm just really pissed off or whatever, and you go, wow, and if you could put a number on that, how pissed off are you? It's a three. Okay, well, let's see you turn that down to a two. Let's turn it up to a four and a half. And you're really working on affect modulation, but you're doing it in an embodied way. And so we do have to kind of keep in the back of our minds that <laughs> we see these pictures of the brain all the time, but they're connected to the body. And we have to provide some activities that allow for some connection to the body. So yeah, drama therapy is really interesting. Again, big field, basic principles are so congruent with anything that is involved in play therapy or sand therapy. It's all about expressing, externalizing, moving, changing. It's, it's beautiful stuff. And it's, again, fits really well. So some drama therapy exercises with families can be really, really fun. I have some videotapes of families doing some stuff together. I'll show some of that, but people will have an opportunity to do it themselves. So then they can see for themselves, well, that was interesting in this way and that way. So. Emily, are there any, any more questions that you have? Well, then <laughs> I'll speak slowly if there's one more. Oh, hand raised. That's a, an applause. Oh, that's an applause. Sorry. Thank I don't you. know all my symbols yet. <laughs> that's thank a thank you. you. Well, Eliana, thank you so much. Uh, it welcome. really sounds like fun. And it's I look forward to seeing you. For sure. And everyone who's watching and watching later, thank you for, very much for joining us. Emily, thanks for being there. And um, hope you have a great day wherever you are. Thank you.